Hello, and welcome back to our final session of the 2021 At Home series. My name is Shelley Hansen, and I am the president of the AAMFT Board of Directors. We have now arrived full circle from our first At Home series one year ago, when we faced much uncertainty, loss, and disruption to our lives. Today, as we conclude our second At Home series, we are closer to reopening practices and schools. Many of us have received vaccinations and the outlook is turning hopeful after a very difficult year. As we continue to practice caution with in-person gatherings, AAMFT's events will again be held virtually. This year, we are very pleased to host our first ever Systemic Family Therapy Conference. Designed as a reimagined approach to the traditional AAMFT annual conference, the SFTC takes a holistic approach to the development and enhancement of family therapists. The conference aims to be the most comprehensive event for systemic thinkers, starting with personal and professional development, moving into cutting edge clinical skills and training, and ending by examining the role of systemic therapy in our communities and institutions and the impact on our global society. In this first year, to further facilitate the creation of a distinct voice and a training home for all systemic thinkers, AAMFT is offering deeply discounted registration to members. For those of you who are not yet members, our membership categories are soon shifting to offer more inclusive options and fewer barriers to becoming a member of AAMFT. We hope you will consider joining and making AAMFT your professional home as we look forward to be welcoming both new and longtime members into the AAMFT family at the inaugural Systemic Family Therapy Conference this fall. Keep an eye on your email for updates about this event. If you are interested in receiving continuing education credits for this session, please consult the reminder email you received this morning. There you will find the check-in code and information on completing your session evaluation and downloading your CE certificate. You will also see the code posted into the chat during the, se the session to assist you. Today's session is being sponsored by CPH and Associates. As the endorsed professional liability insurance provider for AAMFT, CPH and Associates is proud to sponsor the AAMFT at home series. CPH provides portable occurrence form coverage that protects you throughout your professional career. During this time of evolving practices, CPH is pleased to assure you that their policy covers telehealth services as long as such services are permitted under your state's law. A policy with CPH provides peace of mind so you can focus on your career. Get policy highlights in an instant quote online at www.cphins.com. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Chloe Madonis, a world-renowned innovator and teacher of family and strategic therapy, Chloe Madonis is an originator of the strategic approach to family therapy. Her nine books, already classics in the field, have been translated into more than 20 languages. Chloe Madonis is a sought after presenter and has spoken at professional conferences all over the world. She has keynoted for the most prominent national and international organizations in the behavioral sciences, including the AAMFT, the NASW, the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, the Erickson Foundation, and the California Psychological Association. Featured in such publications as Newsweek, the Washington Post, and the Boston Globe, her work has also earned her numerous awards for outstanding contributions to the field. She is currently president of Robbins Madonna's Training and of the Madonna's Institute. Welcome, Chloe. Hello, everyone. I am happy and very honored to be here talking to you. And uh, my subject is uh, stories of psychotherapy. 
So I would like to start by giving you a very brief introduction to my approach. This is a strategic family therapy approach. And uh, I'll give you the most important concepts very briefly, and then I will go into the stories directly. So one concept that is fundamental to the approach is that when a problem presents to therapy, the problem or the challenge exists because of the social context in which it takes place. So that the easiest, most effective way of resolving a presenting problem is to change the social context of the, of the person. And of course, the most relevant social context is usually the family the people with whom the individual has a past, a present, and will have a future together, the ongoing relationships of the person. And that is what we change. Now, sometimes the most important context is the school or the workplace or the hospital, for example. And then we intervene to change that social context. Another fundamental concept is that our basic tool is the directive. We ask people to do certain things inside the therapy room and out of the therapy room. And um, some of the directives are very simple, like uh, go out to dinner with, uh, with your spouse. And some can be more complicated. Some directives are straightforward and others are indirect. For example, an example of an indirect directive would be to say to a husband, I don't want you to be so nice to your wife this week that she might have a heart attack. So you're actually telling him to be nice, but you do it in an indirect way. And so uh, given that the directive as the most important tool, there's all kinds of possibilities of making a contribution to the approach because one can always come up with new directives that apply to different contexts and, um, and different situations. So it's possible to have a lot of fun in creating uh, new directives within this approach. Another important concept is self-determination. We believe that the person has free will. We believe the opposite of uh, a deterministic approach. It, we, we believe that whatever your parents did during your childhood is not going to determine your present and your future. There is always a choice to be made. You can create your own present and your own future. And another important concept is that we believe that people change through action. You can talk to people forever and it will be difficult to bring about a change, not impossible. Of course, everybody knows that you can change simply by reading a book or meeting somebody new. But in the context of therapy, you have to ask people to do something different than what they've been doing. And that's going to what that's going to be what leads to change. So as you listen to my stories, I want you to think about what is the common thread that ties them all together. There is a common thread. There is a commonality among the stories in spite of the fact that they seem to be very different. So I challenge you to find what is that commonality and then at the end of my talk, I will tell you what I think it is. All right, so I'm going to start with the, the stories and I pick these stories because either they were very challenging, very difficult, or because I did something that I considered especially uh, creative or innovative. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the story of Amy. Uh, and I'll start with the social context of the story. When I lived in Washington, D.C., I actually lived in Bethesda, Maryland. And I used to commute to Baltimore, Maryland, 
to the University of Maryland Hospital to train um, psychiatric residents, psychology interns, and social work interns. And I did this for several years, and it was quite a commute. And at the same time, I was developing my own institute in Washington, DC. And at one point, I just got tired of the commute, and I quit going to the hospital. And one day, I get a call from the director of training who says that he would like my help in a very difficult case that is coming into the hospital that day. And uh, this is the daughter of a VIP, a very important man, um, wealthy businessman. And uh, she is now 26 years old. And she's been going from one hospital to the other, always institutionalized since the age of 16. She has multiple diagnoses, among them epilepsy. And the epilepsy is so bad and she doesn't respond to medication that they're bringing her into the hospital in an ambulance because she has to take the medication constantly or uh, she go into a seizure. And uh, could I do the therapy? And so I said, no, I can't, uh, I can't commute uh, to, to the hospital at this point in my life. I'm just too busy. But this is what we could do. Give me a psychiatric resident or a psychology intern that I can supervise, somebody that will be there in the hospital every day, all the time. And I will supervise him or her and um, we'll talk on the phone and I'll take on the case in this way. So he said, okay, let's do that. And he gave me a young man, a psychology intern. And so um, before the first session, I discussed the case with the intern and I said to him, uh, I think of all the diagnosis that she has, because she had multiple personality disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, all kinds of things. I think the most important one to control right away is the epilepsy, because it's impossible to even talk to her because of the frequency of her seizures, and because the seizures are very dangerous, she could, she could die. She was also suicidal. So that was another important thing to control, but I felt that the epilepsy was related to all the other diagnoses and was most important. So I said, I want you to contact the parents and tell them that they have to come once a week to the hospital for a family therapy session. And um, the parents were, were divorced and uh, the, the divorce had happened when this young woman was 16 years old, and that was the time when she had the psychotic break and went into the hospital. So I suspected that the hospitalization, the psychotic break, was related to the parents' divorce. It may have started as an attempt for the parents to stay together, and then it developed a life of its own. Or perhaps it was her pain and suffering and the idea that the parents were going to separate that led to the break. She was the youngest of five children. Uh, the, she had, uh, I don't remember, said three or four older brothers that were successful. And the parents uh, lived in different cities. So they would have to fly into Baltimore for the therapy sessions. And they accepted this. So I prepared the intern and I said, what I want you to do is uh, when, when they come in, um, I want you to explain that it's very important to control the epileptic seizures because they're very dangerous and she's not responding to medication. So, one way to control an unwanted behavior is to have it deliberately. Because if you can have it deliberately, then you can stop having it deliberately. 
And so what you would like to do is to ask Amy to pretend to have a seizure. You know that it's impossible to her for her to actually bring on the seizure, but she can pretend to have a seizure. Doing all the behaviors that happen when she has a seizure, maybe uh, falling, shaking, screaming, whatever, whatever it is. And when she does that, you want the parents to hug her and caress her and tell her that they love her and they're always going to be there for her and they'll take care of her. And I said to the intern, Amy is going to get very angry at this directive. She's going to say, this is ridiculous. Uh, how is that going to help? She's probably going to insult you. And when she starts insulting you and screaming at you, you have to say, oh, good, that's a seizure. Now the parents have to hug her and hold her and kiss her. And I'm glad that I prepared the intern because, of course, Amy flew into a rage at the suggestion that she would pretend to have a seizure. And not only did she scream, but she threatened the therapist. She called him all kinds of names and insults. And the therapist said, good, thank you very much. That was a seizure. Now the parents can come and hold her and hug her and so on. And the parents complied with this. And uh, the sessions continued, and in about three weeks of doing this, Amy began to respond to the medication, to the anti-seizure medication. And uh, so I was, I was very happy with this. And um, one day, the intern calls me and says, you know, there's going to be a grand rounds meeting on Amy's case. Did they invite you? And I said, no, they didn't invite me, but I'll be there. I'm coming anyway. And um, so the grand rounds for those of you who may not know what that is, I think it still exists. In, in mental hospitals, uh, there is a tradition of once a week getting all the staff together and presenting a case with the different opinions of different professionals on, on the diagnosis and what to do about it and so on. So I, I went to Baltimore, I went to the hospital for, for this meeting. I arrived a little bit late and somebody was already talking about Amy. And uh, he said that she was schizophrenic. Then another, um, Another professional spoke and he said that uh, she was bipolar and that was related to her multiple suicide attempts that were very dangerous because she would manage to find something in the hospital that she could break and then slit her wrist in the middle of what whoever was watching, whatever was going on. So, and this happened frequently. Then somebody else spoke and he said that um, she had multiple personalities and he had discovered like 12 personalities or something like that. And then there was an invited speaker from a prestigious university, a psychiatrist, a woman who had interviewed Amy and she stood up and said that Amy was the typical person that would either succeed in killing herself or would end up a chronic patient in the back wards of the hospital for the rest of her life. I was outraged at, at this opinion. And then, to my surprise, Amy stood up. I didn't even know that she was in the room. And she appeared very collected. And she said that, she had been in the hospital library reading about the effects of the medications that she was given. And she believed that if they took her off the medications, she would get better because she felt that she was toxic from all the medications that she had to take. I was so impressed and I was so enraged that Amy had to listen to this dire prediction from, from the psychiatrist. And 
I kept saying to, me, to myself, be calm, Chloe, be strategic. You have to do something. You have to save this girl. Uh, and getting angry or enraged is not going to do it. So the meeting ended. And I saw that uh, the chairman of the department um, was there. And uh, I walked towards him and said, hello, Dr. So-and-so, I haven't seen you in so long. And he said, oh, Chloe, it's so nice to see you. And I said, I, yeah, I know we haven't talked for so long. Uh, let's, let's have lunch. Would you like to have lunch together? And he said, yeah, let's go to the cafeteria. So we went to the cafeteria and um, we sat down and I said to him, you know that Amy's seizures are under control. And it's just because of the family therapy that I have been supervising. And he said, I know. And I am so impressed. He happened to be a specialist in epilepsy. That's why Amy had been transferred to this hospital. And he said, I'm, I am very impressed that you were able to do that. And I said, yes, I, I enjoyed this. She's such a lovely young woman. And I said to him, I can't imagine the responsibility that you have thinking that this young woman might succeed in killing herself any moment in your hospital. And she is so difficult to take care of. I cannot imagine the stress that you're under. And he was looking at me like, what is all this compassion? And, and then I said, you know, I would like to take her out of the hospital. She could live with her mother, and I'm sure the mother would love to have her. And they could come once a week for therapy, for family therapy at my institute in a suburb of Washington, uh, D.C. And I'll take full responsibility together with the psychology intern that I'm working with. And uh, to my surprise, he said, oh, all right. Uh, I said, I would like to do it right away, like tomorrow morning. And he said, okay, Chloe, go ahead, that's good. So I said, I have to run. And I got the intern on the phone and I said, you have to call the parents right away. They have to be here in the hospital first thing in the morning and be prepared to get her out. And she's going to be with her mother, living with her mother. And tomorrow they're coming to my institute for a therapy session. And so the next day they arrived at the institute and we had a conversation basically about how Amy had missed out on all her developmental stages from the age of 16 to 26. She, she looked like a mental patient. She was dressed like a mental patient. She had not even finished high school. She needed a new wardrobe. She needed to sign up for some uh, seminars, she needed to, to read some books, she needed to have friends. And so we, we said that since Amy would be living uh, with a mother, we would put the father in charge of all these things. And the father agreed to help her to uh, buy clothes, meet some people, sign up for seminars, learn to drive, things like this. And it was funny because Amy said, yeah, I would like to meet some young men because uh, if I'm going to die, like that doctor said, I don't want to die a virgin. So she, she had a great sense of humor. So they came back the next week and the father had done nothing. So we said, okay, we're going to give you another chance, one more week. They came back the following week. Amy was looking better, but she had managed to find clothes and do these things by herself. The father had done nothing. And we were prepared for that. So the therapist said, you know, some people are orphans. They don't have parents. And yet they can lead a good life and they can succeed in life. Uh, what is very difficult is if you think you have parents and you really 
don't have parents. So let me ask you, sir, he said to the father, are you a father to Amy or not? Are you dead or are you a father? And he said, I'm dead. But we were prepared for that. So the therapist said, well, since you're dead, Amy now has to inherit you. And the father was shocked. And the therapist said, uh, of course, she can't have your whole in inheritance because she has three brothers, but she needs one fourth of her inheritance and we have to get it now. And the father said, oh, that's impossible. My assets are all tied up and this and that. And also it's not fair to her brothers. And the therapist said, I have your son's information and I'm going to call them and tell them and ask their permission, which he did later. And all the brothers agreed they would do anything for their little sister. And so from then on, all the therapy focused on was how to get money out of the old man. And we managed to get her an apartment. All this time, there was no seizure. So the medications were being reduced except for the anti-seizure medication, which she was going to have to be on all her life. And so gradually, with the help of a psychiatrist, we took her off all of the psychiatric medications. There were no more suicide attempts, no more crazy talk, none of that. She was very focused and very happy on getting money out of the old man. And that was the whole focus of the therapy. She met a young man that wasn't so great and dated him for a while. And then she met one that was really a good person and she married him. And we followed this case for 10 years. There was never a recurrence of any of the symptoms and uh, she was fine. So I love this case because of the complexity of all the diagnosis, the hospital involvement and so on. Um, so think about it. Think about what can be done to save people from uh, the grip of bad therapy, basically. And as family therapists, we can do it. I knew how to get her out of the hospital and I knew how to connect her uh, to her family. And that's how we succeeded. All right. So um, another story that... Uh, it's, uh, it's also a very difficult case. Uh, when I was living in a suburb of Washington, D.C., there was a um, psychiatric hospital in the area that specialized in severe anorexia. And when they had a very difficult case that they were failing with, they would send them to me. And they knew that I did family therapy. So they would refer the family to me. So this was a girl that was about uh, 15 years old. Um, the, the parents had married after knowing each other for only a couple of months. And uh, they divorced as soon as the mother was pregnant, which was um, a couple of months into the marriage. The father was a famous lawyer. Uh, the mother was uh, sort of a, a charity benefactor kind of person. She, um, she seemed very needy. Uh, she was a child of Holocaust survivors. She had an aunt who had died of anorexia. And uh, I soon found out after just one or two sessions that the parents hated each other. They lived just a few blocks from each other because since the, the girl who I will call uh, Linda, since Linda was born, they would pass her from one home to another. And both parents were very involved with her. That's why they, they lived close together. 
and they truly hated each other. Uh, the father had contempt for the mother, thinking that she was frail, weak, and incompetent. The mother thought that the father was a bully, bossy, grandiose, and uh, impossible to deal with. So when they came to the first session, I saw the girl looked like a cadaver, like a skeleton, and she was connected to, to tubes, apparently. They, they had to give her stuff intravenously, and uh, she was very, very frail and, uh, and like a skeleton. And she was ruminating, which is a symptom of anorexia. They bring up food and they chew it, they swallow it again, and they chew it and they're chewing and, and swallowing constantly. And it was really very difficult to have any meaningful conversation uh, with her. The mother actually did not come to the first session because she had some charity events. So I made sure that she would come to the second session. And uh, so they explained to me that the girl didn't eat anything. That's why she was hospitalized. And uh, because the hospital had failed to improve her in any way, she was now back at home with her mother and seeing the father. And the father would take her almost every day to her market where she could buy seeds. That's all that she ate was seeds and maybe a little bit of a vegetable. And uh, she was dying. So I spent a couple of sessions talking about the family situation. And I realized the severity of the hatred between the mother and the father. And so I decided to take action. And I called the father and I said, the next session, I want to see you alone. So he came to the session alone. And I said, you know, you're a very busy person and I don't want to waste your time. And I'm a very busy person myself and I don't want to waste my time. So I'm going to tell you what you have to do if you want to save your daughter's life. If you don't do it, she will surely die. So it's your choice. Do you want to save her life? And he said, yes, of course I want to save her life. What, what do I have to do? And I said, this is what you have to do. The war between you and your ex-wife has to stop. There can be no more war, no more criticism on your part. Not one gesture of anger or, or displeasure. I want you every day when you drive um, Linda to, to buy her seeds or when you see her, anytime that, you were, that you're with Linda, several times a day, I want you to say, I want to tell you, Linda, that I love your mother. I don't love you as my wife. He was actually remarried. But I love her as your mother. And I will always love her as your mother because I love you. And she's your mother. And I will always protect her and take care of her. Anything she wants, she will always be able to count on me. I will always be there for her. And not only you have to say this to Linda several times a day, every day, but you have to tell her mother, I love you and I always will because you're the mother of my daughter who I adore. And I want you to know that anything you need, you just have to ask me. And I will interrupt whatever I'm doing and I provide it. And I said to him, you have to get an assistant because if you're in court, you're busy, whatever, and your ex-wife needs something and you can't do it, you, have, you need an assistant that will immediately do it for her. So you have to show in your actions that you will take care of her. And you have to repeat this to her also, not as frequently as to your daughter, but but frequently so that she really gets to believe it and you have to show it in your actions. And he looked at me and said incredulously, 
So then Linda will eat. And I said, yeah, she will eat. Then she will eat. And he did this. And in a matter of weeks, Linda was eating. And she quickly regained the lost weight. And she wanted to go back to her school from where she had been expelled because she looked so horrible that it was shocking for the other students in the school to see her like that. She was going to a very prestigious uh, private school. She was a very intelligent girl. So I had to uh, call the principal and say, I guarantee she's going to be fine. She's not going to go into anorexia again. Please, please take her back into school so she can resume a normal life. And the principal did. And there was never a recurrence and uh, she was fine. So there is no underestimating the importance of that triangle. When, when there is enmity and hatred between the parents, how it reflects on the child. And it's so important to keep this in mind for any type of child or adolescent uh, symptom. All right, so another interesting, interesting case. A, a friend of mine one day said, you know, I have a friend um, who uh, is very depressed because he was fired from his job and he cannot find another job and he's talking suicide. At that point, I was already living in California where I live now. And he said, would you see him even if only once? He cannot pay. But I think that you could help him in even one session. So I said, sure. So uh, he walked in um, and uh, he walked in slowly, heavily. He was overweight, looked very sad. And he sat heavily on the couch. And I said, how can I help you? And he said, well, I'm very depressed to the point that I'm, I've even had suicidal thoughts because I lost my job and I can't find another job. And it's been six months now and I can't come out of, of this depression. So I looked at him and I said, uh, you're depressed because you lost your job and you're not working. And he said, yes, I'm very depressed because of this. And I said, oh, you have to explain that to me a little better. You know, I am an old hippie, I'm much older than you. And I belong to that generation that we thought not working was great. None of my friends worked. We didn't believe in work. We actually called it the rat race. And we didn't want to be rats. Uh, we, we believed in, uh, tune in, turn on, and drop out. We wanted to drop out. And here you're going to commit suicide because you're not working? Explain that. So he said, well, a man's self-esteem is tied to his work. And um, I'm actually the only person in my family with a college degree. So for me to be working productively was always very important. Oh, I said, well, uh, I don't think so. I still, I still don't get it. Tell me, uh, what was your work? And he said, I'm an engineer and I always worked in plants that manufacture weapons. I said, oh, great. So the world is a better place because you're not working. Great. At this point, he was beginning to smile. He was beginning to catch on that I was a little bit different. <laughs> and, and so I said, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to go back to work at some point, And then you're going to be sorry for all the things that you could have done when you were not working that you didn't go do because you were moping around depressed. I said, do you have a girlfriend? And he said, no, no, I'm not working. I don't have any money. Of course, I can't have a girlfriend. I said, when, how is love connected to money? There's no connection. 
you should find a woman and have some fun. We're in California, go to the beach, go to the mountains, go to the zoo. The San Diego Zoo is the best in the world. And so we continued in this vein for a little longer and he left. The next morning, I'm sitting in my office and he calls me on the phone and he says, good morning. I just wanted to tell you that it's a beautiful day. And I look at out the window and I say, yeah, it's a beautiful day. And he said, and I'm at the zoo. He paused and added with a woman. So uh, he had heard me. So I had a follow up. He sent me a letter some months later saying, thanking me for what I had done and telling him how he had enjoyed his time not working. And now he had a job and, uh, and he was fine. So it's important not to underestimate what you can do in just one session by reframing the whole situation in a way that makes sense. All right, so another favorite case um, involved um, a therapist uh, that worked not too far from me when I was in, in Maryland. And he called me and he said that he needed uh, family therapy for a serious problem with his son. And, but it had to be me. He didn't want any of my students or anybody on my staff. And I would do what I do, the therapy, since he was a colleague. And uh, I said, of course, so tell me a little bit of what is the situation. So he said, my son, who is 15 years old and in high school, uh, started to talk about how he couldn't go to school because there were people that were following him with weapons that wanted to kill him. And he's now afraid of going to school after being an excellent student and not having any problem like this. So I think that this is a psychotic break. This is a paranoid schizophrenia, he said. And I know why. And I said, why? And he said, because I divorced my wife because I'm gay and I'm living with my male partner. And I think that this is a reaction to the fact that I got a divorce because I'm gay and this whole situation. And I said, well, we'll see, we'll see. So I asked them all, I would ask them to come in and there was an older sister, just a year or two older. So they came in and it was interesting because the first thing that the father did was check the room to make sure that he wasn't being recorded. Speak of paranoid schizophrenia. There was a one-way mirror in the room because that's the way I teach, but of course nobody was behind the mirror. There were no cameras that were working, but he had to check everything. He really didn't want this to be uh, recorded. So uh, we began to talk and uh, we talked about normal life and the, the children seemed um, pretty normal to me. The boy was shy and quiet, the girl was uh, talkative and funny. She said, you know, um, about the divorce of my parents, it's one thing to go to school and tell everyone that your parents are getting divorced. It's another thing to go to school and tell everyone your parents are getting divorced because your father is gay. That is another level of issue. And I said, yes, and we laughed about it. And I could tell that the father had handled this well. So we talked about school and what the children wanted to do when they grew up. And the mother said in a very strict way, my son is going to be a doctor because all the men in my family are doctors and he's going to be a doctor and there's no question about it, that's settled. She said it in such a way with such authority and aggression that I thought, oh my, I cannot, I cannot even challenge this. So I said I wanted to speak with the children alone. So I saw the girl and she was fine. 
And then I sat with a boy and I said, what do you like to do other than, than school? And he said, I can't do anything. I'm in all advanced classes. So I have so much homework that there's no time to do absolutely anything. I said, do you have a sport? Do you have a hobby? What do you do? Nothing, he said. I have to do schoolwork all the time. That's all that I do. So um, I looked at him and I said, uh, you have big feet. Do you play basketball? I bet you can jump. And he said, I told you, I can't play basketball or do anything because I'm in advanced classes. And I said, okay, I'm going to make you a deal. So if I get you out of the advanced classes into normal classes and into the basketball team at the school, will you promise me that uh, you'll stop talking about these people that are after you with guns and knives that want to kill you? And he said, yes. And I said, Okay, will you give me a high five and a shake? And we did. <laughs> and uh, I said, tell me again that you promised me. He said, I promise you. So um, I brought in the rest of the family and I said, okay, I think uh, that your son is going to be well. So I would just like to say goodbye. It was a pleasure talking with all of you. And the father said, what do you mean? You said you were going to do family therapy. We have to schedule another session. I said, I don't think another session is going to be needed because this is what's going to happen. You, I said to the father, are going to go to the school and get your son out of all the advanced classes. You're going to assert yourself and say, you don't want him there anymore. You're going to go and talk to the basketball coach and get him into the basketball team. And then he'll be fine. And the father said, no, 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 you promised family therapy. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll find a middle ground. I'm, I'll make you a deal. Let's wait a month. If in a month, your son is still talking about these people after him and appears disturbed and all this, we will do family therapy once a week for as long as it takes. But if he's fine, no family therapy. So the father called me in a month and said, you were right, he's fine. I got him out of the special advanced classes and he's in the basketball team having a lot of fun and, and he's fine. There's no symptoms. I said, well, thank you. Thank you. This makes me so happy. And uh, so they left. So like um, three years later, something like that, maybe two and a half or three years later, I'm working with students at my institute and the receptionist comes in and says, there's a, a lady on the phone. She says her name is Mrs. I, I invent a common name, Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Smith or something like that. And uh, she says that you will remember her and you will know who she is. And I said, oh yeah, the mother of the basketball boy. And so I said, I, I'll pick up the phone. And uh, she said, Chloe, I want to tell you that uh, my son got, I can't remember whether he was admitted to Yale or Princeton, but one of those uh, Ivy League university without having to be in all the special classes. And he's been playing basketball all this time and he's a great basketball player. And I want to thank you, she said. And I also want to tell you that I have your picture on the countertop of my kitchen. So when I cook for my family, I can look at you. That was so moving, it was so wonderful. So that boy, if they had gone to somebody else, that boy could have started a career as a mental patient very easily. The father already had him diagnosed and ready for that. Fortunately, he had the good sense uh, to come to me and to come to family therapy. 
Okay, I think I have time for uh, one more. So this is in a completely different vein, maybe even more than more than one. So uh, one day I get a call from a, a woman who says she needs couples therapy. And um, she got recommended by someone. And could, could I see them in couples therapy? It's a, it's a serious, important uh, problem. And I said, uh, yes, but can you tell me a little bit about what the issues are? And she said, well, it's a delicate issue. It's a difficult issue. Well, can you say a little bit about it? How long have you been married? So she says, like, maybe 15 years or something like that. Said, so, do you have any children? No. Uh, how have you gotten along in the past? And she said, very well. We're best friends. We have a great relationship. So tell me what, can you tell me what the problem is just a little bit? Well, you know, it's difficult to say, I would like to meet with you. To make a long story short, I spoke with the husband also before the first session and I couldn't pin him down to what the problem was. And so they came in and they told me they had been friends before getting married. They were best friends after getting married. They had a great relationship. They had good times together. And I couldn't, I couldn't get them to explain how could I help them or what was the issue. So finally I said, okay, can I guess what the issue is? Um, is it about sex? And they said, yes. And I said, is it about infidelity? And uh, she said, yes. And he immediately said, no. I never touched a woman. I never even spoke to her. There was no infidelity. So to make a long story short, what I slowly discovered was that he liked to visit a dominatrix who would beat him up. And that was what he enjoyed. And of course, he didn't touch her or talk to her because those are the rules in such an experience. And uh, this was bad enough, and the wife knew about this. But what had triggered the wanting to come to therapy was even much worse. What happened was that the wife worked for a company where she had to have a security clearance because they manufactured something for the military. So the responsibility and the confidentiality and so on was very important for her in her work. The husband was retired, so he had plenty of time to indulge in his fantasies. And one day he decided, why should he pay for a dominatrix when probably on the internet, he could find a woman that would like to beat him up for free. And so he posted a picture of himself nude. And this was, um, this, this was a very chubby, very chubby, overweight man. So I can imagine the picture of him nude. He must have looked like a little pig. He posted this on the internet and asked for a woman who would like to whip him and beat him up. And a woman responded. In the meantime, the wife and her company had a supervisory capacity and she had an employee, a woman that she needed to fire. It was difficult for her to, to fire her because of all kinds of legal reasons. And finally she managed to find a way to fire. Um, and so then, uh, there was a farewell lunch for this woman that was leaving uh, the job. And the woman showed up with a picture of the husband naked that he had published on the internet. And she was the dominatrix that he had hired to beat him up. So this was a huge scandal in the company. The wife 
almost lost her job. And of course she was very resentful and she felt that this had to change. This was so dangerous what he was doing. So I thought, how, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to come up with something here? I had never had a case like this. And so um, I said, all right. So the issue here is that this can be considered an infidelity because this is something that you, the husband, you do secretly, even though you, you tell the wife, you tell your wife that you've done this, that you visited a dominatrix. This is a part of your life that you don't share with her. And everything else in your life, you share with her. And it's very important because your guys are best friends and you love each other. So what I, I need for you to do is that this has to be a project of the two of you. And I said to the wife, I need to put you in charge of his visits to a dominatrix. I want you to choose who the woman is and what's going to happen. And I want you to be present in his sessions uh, with the dominatrix. And of course, it's important to do this in a legal way. So you're going to have to find a dominatrix in Nevada where this kind of thing is legal. And you're going to have to fly there uh, for the sessions. And I want you to be present and observe the sessions with the dominatrix. Then it will be something that the two of you do together, like a hobby that you have together, a little bit unusual. She said, oh, I don't think I can do this, Anna, but I convinced her and she accepted to do this. And they were from out of town. So I, I had a couple of sessions uh, live with them and then we, we talked on the phone. And she found a dominatrix in Nevada and started going to her with a husband and being present in the sessions. And the two women, became best friends, the dominatrix and the wife. And it turned out that the dominatrix was also an aerobics instructor. And so one day the two women talked about how the husband was really overweight and needed to get in shape and needed to lose weight and develop muscle. And so the wife said to the dominatrix, I want you to make part of the session that he gets on the treadmill, he lifts weights, he jogs in place. So we need to help him uh, to lose weight. And so one day the husband out of the blue calls me and says, Chloe, I want to tell you that I'm never going to do the dominatrix thing again. I'm in horrible pain. These two women, my wife and the other woman, decided to get me into shape. And they made me exercise to the point that I thought I was going to die. I was sure I was going to have a heart attack. And now I'm in such pain that I can't even move. I can't walk. And I said, what's that? Didn't you have a safe word that you say, stop, I'm in pain? Why didn't you stop it? And he said, I can't. I had two wives, two, two women uh, beating him on me up and torturing me. I couldn't stop. I just couldn't stop it. I had to go on. But I'm never going to do this again. So that was the end of that uh, sexual preference. I think it was one, one of the most interesting fun cases that I have ever had. So let me see if I can, um, I can, I can fit one more very quickly. So uh, this one I call creating good memories. And this was a couple that came for a very serious problem that the wife was diabetic and she did nothing to take care of her diabetes. She wouldn't take the insulin. She wouldn't test herself. She wouldn't do the diet. And she said that she couldn't do this because of the bad relationship with her husband. The husband was a big man who could appear to be violent just by his presence. 
but he was not a violent man, but he had a bad temper and they fought a lot. So a typical situation, they would be having dinner with the children, the husband would pick up a plate of spaghetti and smash it against the wall. So it was that kind of, uh, of situation. And the therapist was a very proper young man, always dressed in a suit with a tie. And he tried to get them to improve their relationship, but uh, to, to no avail. Uh, they came to the sessions, one session after another, and they were always talking about junk and garbage. They were fighting about who would pick up after the dog, who would take out the garbage, who would bring in the garbage can, who would clean the garage, all this conversation. And I could tell the couple was not getting any better, but the, the therapist was getting worse, more and more depressed. So one day I got him out of the room behind the mirror and I said to him, you have to do something different because this is not going anywhere. So I, I want you to ask the wife if she has ever uh, read the book or seen the movie Gone with the Wind. And she probably has because Gone in the Wind is probably uh, the, the most popular movie in, in the Western world and the novel is very famous also. And when she says to you, why do you ask? I want you to say, because you so remind me of Scarlett, the, the woman played by Vivian Lee in the film. Scarlett was always trying to, um, to change um, her lover, who the actor was, uh, Clark Gable. And she never managed to change him. So I'm surprised that you have here a handsome husband and you constantly try to change him instead of enjoying his temperamental, spontaneous nature. So it turned out that the wife not only had seen the movie, but she was an expert and gone with the wind and uh, had seen the movie like five times and read the book three times, something like that. And she said to the therapist, no, 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 that's not true. Scarlett did change him. And the therapist said, I'll bet you $20 that you read the book again and you won't find one sentence that shows that he changed it all. And eventually she conceded that he, she had not changed him in, in, in the novel. But this was elevating the couple to the level of the most romantic couple in the Western world. And so the husband who had no resemblance to Clark Gable, except that he had a mustache, began to look at himself in the mirror and twirl his mustache. He was delighted at the comparison. And of course she was delighted also because this was her favorite movie, her favorite novel. So then I had the therapist say to them, all I want you to do is in the next two weeks, because, uh, um, well, wait a moment, I'm trying to get through in time and I forgot something really important that I have to say. So the therapist said to them, I want you to know what are your best memories with each other. And of course they said they had no good memories. They had always fought, always insulted each other, treated each other badly. There were no good memories. So I called the therapist on the intercom and I said, just be silent and tell them that you wait because the good memories will come. Every couple has some good memories. And so the therapist waited and then the husband remembered a good memory, which was in their honeymoon. One night he had gone out by himself. They were in Florida for their honeymoon and there was a, a pool with dolphins and he had observed the trainer practicing with the dolphins and having them jump out of the water. He had learned the signals and the next evening he took his wife for a walk to the pool, gave the signals and the dolphins began to jump and do their tricks for her. And she remembered that and she was very moved. And then she remembered something else wonderful that he had done on the birth of their first child. So then the therapist said, all I want you to do in the next two weeks is create a good memory. 
And it could be something that the two of you do, just the two of you together. It could be something that the two of you do with your children. It just create a good memory, something that you will remember forever, like the episode with the dolphins. And so uh, they went off and they began to, they created a good memory. They came back, they told what the good memory was. They planned another good memory and they came back and reported on that. And uh, we kept on just creating good memories, nothing else. We never talked about the diabetes. We didn't talk about the relationship, just about creating good memories. I remember at the end, it was the winter in Washington, DC, and um, they decided they were going to go ice skating on the Potomac River. And the Potomac never freezes completely. So I was thinking, I am going to lose this, this couple uh, to the Potomac River. They are going to break the ice because they were both big people and they're going to drown in the Potomac, but they didn't. And so the whole thing lasted about three, three and a half months, just creating good memories. After which they said they wanted to bring their children so that they would meet the therapist. And her diabetes was under control. Uh, she was keeping the diet and doing everything she had to do. And the two of them were getting along uh, very well. And she said, my diabetes is under control because now I have a good relationship with my husband. So that is the strategy of creating good memories. And we're on the hour. So thank you very much. I enjoyed talking with you. I hope I've inspired you a little bit. Thank you so much, Chloe, for sharing these stories from your remarkable career. Again, a word of thanks to our sponsors of this series, CPH and Associates. And remember, if you're seeking to obtain CE credits for attending this session, you must follow the instructions in the email you received for today's presentation. I hope that you have all enjoyed our entire 2021 at home series. On behalf of the AAMFT Board of Directors, thank you all for being with us. We hope to see you at the Systemic Family Therapy Conference this fall. Farewell for now. <laughs>